Welcome to the live stream, everyone. As we're four minutes away from 3 p.m. on a Tuesday afternoon, I'm Stan Morris. Today's top national story on your screen right now and the cancellation of Roseanne. We want to know, what do you think about Roseanne being canceled? Do you think this is a big conspiracy against conservatives? Or if you're more of the liberally minded type, do you think it was justice? on Roseanne. Tell us what you think. The cancellation of Roseanne is our NEA Reacts question today. We may be actually using your answer at the tail end of our program. Stand by, everybody. We have a busy show today. We hope that you'll hang around with us and wait until the end of our program as we'll read some of your comments and maybe even show a few of them on the screen. Uh, thanks, everybody. We hope you had a great Memorial Day weekend. And stand by as we're about to make it even better with a little bit of news. Haley Norris Realtor. No. Should I make my hair go like this? Whether you need to buy, sell, or lease. Haley, can I use my hands? Or is yeah. that, where, where are my hands? Where do they go? Just say Haley. <laughs> Just say Haley. <laughs> Whether, <laughs> <laughs> you need my expertise. Haley Norris Realtor. Or even do a commercial lease. Haley Norris Realtor. Do, should I say Remax Real Estate Center or not? Is that too salesy? No, that's good. My average days on market is just 50 days. You need my expertise. And that means I'm putting more money back in your pocket. Tonight on NEA Report, abortions in the state of Arkansas as the Supreme Court cleared the way today for a law blocking medication-induced abortions. In other words, it gives doctors the ability to block a woman from having a medication-induced abortion. And that law, if it's not challenged, which Planned Parenthood says it's going to, but if it's not successfully challenged, will go into law this summer. So is this the right move for the state of Arkansas? And is this going to help the state of Arkansas? Or is this a political play to make the pro-life types happy that will actually not do much for us, but may even hurt Arkansas? We're going to look at some hard answers coming up. Statistics and facts and science. We're not looking at baloney. It's all reality. That's next. Plus, the opioid epidemic and stuff that you've not heard about related to that, including how it may not be as bad in Arkansas as you might have heard. The top story tonight has massive implications nationwide, but right here at home in the state of Arkansas. Today, the Arkansas Supreme Court refused to block an Arkansas law that would target medication abortions. This also resulted in what threatens to now leave the state of Arkansas with one abortion clinic for three million plus people. One clinic. That was all out of this decision today, the Arkansas Supreme Court, and it's getting actually nationwide attention. The New York Times, the USA Today, they're all covering this. As the court turned away Planned Parenthood's initial challenge to a 2015 law, a federal trial court judge had blocked it, calling it undue burden that was placed on women who sought abortions. But an appeals court said opponents first, for some reason, needed to estimate how many women would be affected. Well, in 2016, a high court had ruled that Texas had a law imposing strict limits on abortion clinics. They said that was unconstitutional because it would, it would reduce the number of facilities in the operation of the entire state from 40 to 7 or 8. That challenge, or rather the challenge to Arkansas law, was based on that precedent, but for now at least, the justices ruled that the law can stand. So what does that mean for the state of Arkansas? Well, it means if nothing else changes by the time July rolls around, it's going to be harder to get an abortion in Arkansas than ever before. And you can argue if you think that's a good thing or not. We're going to go through some facts today and discuss a little bit about that. For starters, Planned Parenthood, a couple of years ago, was on the receiving end of a huge misinformation campaign that alleged that they were literally trafficking baby parts for sale. I can't believe I actually have to address this, but that has been debunked uh, very much clearly so. So I'm not going to go through all of that today. 
Uh, Planned Parenthood also primarily does not offer abortion services. It generally speaking offers a number of services for new mothers, low income mothers, or just expecting families. Uh, they do perform abortions as part of what they do. It's a very small part. Well, let's talk about this a little bit more because it was the Planned Parenthood Executive Vice President uh, that actually sent this statement out. Arkansas now shamefully responsible for being the first state to ban medication abortion. It says this dangerous law also immediately ends access to safe legal abortion at all but one health center in the state. At all but one health center in the state. I almost read that wrong because it's hard to fathom that we're going to have one clinic in the state of Arkansas, if this goes, for women in Clay County or in Texarkana or in Fayetteville to go to. How does that work? Is that an undue burden? Well, that's the term that we're going to get into next because it says if that's not an undue burden, what is? That's from the executive VP of Planned Parenthood. Uh, and it says the law cannot and must not stand. We will not stop fighting for every person's right to access safe legal abortion. Undue burden is a term that is the standard set by the Supreme Court when measuring restrictions of a woman's reproductive rights. You see, it's considered an undue burden if you're placing an unfair restriction on a woman who wants an abortion for her to get it. Now, of course, since this battle for Roe v. Wade has been fought along the way by every person that's scraping for every uh, chance at a point that they can make, some arguments, I guess, going to now be devoted to undue burden. And if one clinic across this entire state is an undue burden. For those still wondering, we're going to clear up a couple other questions here. Medication abortions are available only in the early part of the pregnancy. That's not a partial birth abortion. And finally, I want to let you know that Arkansas lawyers called it a common sense requirement. That's usually a red flag when lawmakers start calling things common sense. Uh, quote, merely requires medication abortion providers to have a contractual relationship, unquote, with a doctor in case follow-up treatment is needed. But that's, that's deceptive because what it does is it says now two doctors can tell you no. It's not just one doctor you have to get permission from. you got to get it from another. It's throwing one more person in there that can put a monkey wrench in the plans. It's sort of like saying, well, it's, what if we had a third doctor? What if we had a fourth or a fifth doctor, right? Well, let me ask you this, guys that are out there, if you had to go to two or three doctors before you could get Viagra prescribed to you, would it discourage you or encourage you? It's that kind of point that is brought up uh, in this case to, to make us think about it from the female perspective. This thing exists called bodily autonomy. Even if you hate abortions, you have to understand what bodily autonomy is. It gives you the right to what happens in your body. So for example, the police, or firefighters, if you're mad about me talking about the police already, uh, they can't steal one of your lungs because your neighbor's lung collapsed and it's needed to save his life. Picture this, picture if somebody needed your blood type and the government could come into your house and forcibly drain your blood to keep another person alive. Because if you think that part is okay, then you're not, you're not for bodily autonomy. If you think that's not okay, then you are for bodily autonomy. This is why you have to sign an organ donor card. There's only one example in our entire world, societies abroad or anything, uh, that is restrictive and, and does not honor bodily autonomy, and that is the discussion about abortions. The big reason why that there's anti-abortion sentiment in the United States is because of religion. And anti-abortion sentiment exists across the globe because of religion. Uh, the idea being that if there is a birth that takes place in your belly, if there is a fertilization, it must have been something that was decided by God, and so you must be forced to have that child. Um, except there are a lot of issues with that. Logically, there are issues with that, uh, such as deformities and whatnot, stillbirths. There's also issues because there's a thing called bodily autonomy. And this is a unique concept. Uh, many of you may never heard of this before. I want to give you the, the simple man's explanation of it. It gives you the right to what happens in your body. So if there's somebody that lives next door to you and he's losing blood fast, the police can't come over and force you to give blood to save his life. You might be willing to do that, um, but it would be a scary world if the government could force you to do that. 
It would be, wouldn't it? That's why you have to sign an organ donor card. Because even your dead body has bodily autonomy rights. But a dead body has more rights than a pregnant woman in the state of Arkansas uh, now because as of this law, if it goes into effect as is stated, women can be denied the right to decide what happens inside of their body. And that is the single only ex uh, exception in the whole wide world to bodily autonomy is, is pregnant women. And specifically, if they are going to be forced to carry that child all the way until they give birth, or if they have the right to say no. And now some people are going to say, well, they have a right before uh, they have sex. Not, I, I mean, for two, two things to that, the men also have that right, and the men aren't being punished for this. And number two would be, um, there are such things as unconsensual sex. And I hate to even get into that as an example. Um, so, But bodily autonomy, even if you hate abortions, and you wish there was never an abortion again, you have to consider individuals' rights, even if what they're doing with those rights makes you feel uncomfortable. Another big issue is that this only affects women. Only affects women. So we're making laws that restrict women with what they can do with their bodies while never doing anything to restrict or uh, create an additional obligation for the men who were most definitely involved in that process. There's never been an abortion law that I've seen that then placed a requirement on the male, on the male contributor to that process. So it's like the law is cut off at the women. Can you imagine if there was a law that said before you went and got Viagra, you had to get another two or three doctor's permissions? See, lawmakers who want to restrict bodily autonomy of women or who want to pass laws against abortion don't vote to fund public programs for the poor. So young mothers will struggle to get by and they live in poverty many, many times. It's not something they can help. When you're young and you don't have your skill set yet developed and you have a child that you didn't ha then have to provide for, you're up against the wall. This is often called being pro-life until the baby's born because you're considered pro-life, but you're not doing much to help that life and once the baby's out of the womb, Right? But it's the same lawmakers who vote for quote-unquote pro-life policies that then vote to cut funding for public programs, for access to medical care, for the poor, and whatnot. Look, we're not trying to change your mind here, all right? What we are trying to do is, is foster a debate that needs to happen in our state if we're going to pl uh, pass blanket laws that say you can't do this anymore or we can have another doctor go in and throw a no at you. you. You've got to be willing to look at every side of this discussion because just like this was passed as a quote unquote common sense law, com the, the word common sense is a red flag in politics because any time that you take a complicated issue and you say it's simple, it generally means you don't understand the issue which I think would be this particular case. I don't think the lawmakers who were involved in this understand the issue. I think they want to pass laws that say abortions are evil. Um, you can believe that if you choose to, but the evidence is not supportive of that. Nations across the country, across, I mean, sorry, across the world that we are allied with, such as Israel, whom we would, many here would probably consider the Holy Land, Abortion is legal there. Um, it's legal in many other developed countries. Women have been singled out in our society by people who legislate from the pulpit. And if we're going to have this debate, we should have this debate with logic and science, not with feelings or faith. And I'm going to show you why with a statistic that is shocking. Arkansas ranks number one. And we love when Arkansas ranks number one, but not in this case, because Arkansas is ranking number one in teen birth rates. We're the number one state in the nation 
for teen birth, ra birth rates, and the number is startling. 36.4 people per 1,000 are teenagers that are giving birth. The national average is 20 per 1,000. So one and a half times, just about. Just about. This map shows where the problem areas are in the United States. And you're going to notice something. The states that have more free laws governing, you know, abortions, the things we're talking about, look how they're doing. The northeastern states. It's not that great in California. But the problem states are the ones that are deep red. And the problem states seem like they're centered around Arkansas. Of course, Arkansas is actually the worst in this. Statistically, it's the worst. Yes, we're the worst on this, this specific ranking. And we just opened the door for things to get even worse than they were before. They're already rough. Now we're going to tell single mothers you got to get extra permission to get an abortion from what is most likely going to be a male doctor. I mean, I don't have the statistics in front of me. Wish I would have of what are the percentage of doctors that are male and female. But most I go to in Arkansas are male. So if you have to pick two, odds are one's going to be, you know. And that's just the beginning. Of course, this is just the beginning of this debate, too. And we want you guys to have this discussion and have these debates. But bring facts into them. We've got to discuss this stuff with facts. Because if we don't, what happens is we end up in this red space, right, that shows Arkansas as being the worst. It's the worst state for teen birth rate. We're pretty high up there on the other things that are related to this. But 34.6, that's as high as the scale went, was 34.6. They had to make the scale go that high for Arkansas. I love my state, so don't think I'm bashing my home. What I'm doing is opening up a box where we have a discussion, and we look at the facts, and we don't just look at what makes us feel good. I actually, a lot of folks say uh, that they, and they think that, that I take a personal interest in these stories. And sometimes I do whenever it's a story about a child that's been kidnapped or an elderly person that was, you know, treated bad. Right. You can't help but not feel for the victim in a lot of these cases. This is all about statistics. I have no personal investment in this. I don't have kids and I'm a guy. Um, but... I do care about my state, and I care about our future, and I care about the future for the people that do have kids. All of my friends have kids, and I care about the future they leave. And Arkansas will have a chance to get better. And that chance comes when we say to ourselves, are we going to pass a law that makes us feel good? Are we going to say, wait a second, let's examine this stuff statistically and factually and say, what are we doing wrong? And what are we doing wrong here? If we're, and the states adjacent to us are the, the worst in the nation for teen births, could it be that those states that we're looking at, like West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Mississippi, Alabama, could it be that those are the same states that are passing anti-abortion laws? Hey, it could be. We'll just have to wait and see. Speaking of statistics, folks, Arkansas may have ranked number one for teen births. But there are other statistics that we were looking at, too. In fact, that we actually got out of uh, research for another story. It was going to be our top story tonight. This all happened. So we have two top stories for you tonight. Because the second top story that we're going to be coming with you after the break is about opioids. How bad are they in Arkansas? Are they really as bad as we're hearing, or are they? I'm not trying to call anybody out on being dishonest because I think there is a serious problem with opioids in Arkansas and in the nation. But when I looked at the statistics today, it showed Arkansas doing a lot better than some states were. In fact, maybe Arkansas is one of the best. We got to tell you good news since we just told you the bad, I guess. 
So hang around. We'll fill you in next on NEI Report. Specializing in unloading contents and packet moves, fully insured and licensed, The Moving Company is the only company to call for your next move. The Moving Company's award-winning team will quickly, safely, and efficiently move your belongings where you need them, whether it's across town or across the country. The Moving Company. Equipped with two full-size moving trucks and all the supplies and tools for any move, the moving company is prepared for the toughest jobs to the most gentle. To book your next move, give us a call at 882-2842 or send us a message to our Facebook page by searching The Moving Company. It's time now for a look at your new wave wireless weather forecast, home of the $49 iPhone screen repair. And we do have a chance for showers and thunderstorms tonight. It actually will go until about 2 a.m. is what the expectation is uh, for the overnight hours. And we're going to see an overnight low around 70. Tomorrow, a 40% chance for showers and thunderstorms as it warms back up uh, to 91 over the 90s once again with mostly sunny skies. And it looks like the biggest chance for showers and thunderstorms is in the afternoon after 2 p.m. tomorrow. Wednesday night, more showers and thunderstorms up until 8 p.m. Thursday, a 20% chance for thunderstorms. Otherwise, just mostly sunny skies and a high near 91. Friday, you do have a chance for thunderstorms before 8 a.m., but it should otherwise just be a mostly sunny day with a high near 93. Saturday, the high is going to jump up to 95. Going to be a warm one then. Uh, and then sunny skies as well. Saturday night, showers have a chance to roll in after 8 p.m., but just a slight chance it'll last into Sunday and then be gone by the time Sunday night comes around. 78 degrees in Jonesboro and some clouds out there are some overcast skies as the sun does its best to desperately peek out. All right, so stand by everybody. I want to show you this video first and then I'm going to tell you what we're talking about. Opioids. We've heard so much about that term in the past few months and years that honestly, by the time we finish hearing about it, we're probably going to be tired of it. But it's still a major problem across Arkansas and across the United States. We've looked at different videos and photos of parents being passed out in the front seat of their cars, their kids sat in the back seat in a, a child's safety seat uh, with mom and dad looking like zombies in the front of their vehicles. Sites like that are hard to forget when we think about this. It's especially frustrating when you take a look at just exactly what led Arkansas and other states into this problem. It was bad marketing. It was misleading 
misleading marketing by the opioid manufacturers because they said these things, and you may not remember this, back in the 90s, the commercials said these things were not habit forming. They were not addictive. And we know so much, like if you told some, you could tell a three-year-old uh, that a hydrocodone is not addictive and they're going to laugh at you these days. Everybody knows it is. At this point, opioids are seen as some of the most addictive substances probably known to humankind. And we have to ask ourselves two big questions. Because we hear about this nationwide, but I always wondered today, and so I set out to do a little research, how bad is it here compared to other places? And is it getting better or worse? Well, I think you're going to be surprised, and I'm not going to spoil it for you, but I wouldn't be asking you to stay tuned if I didn't have some surprising answers, so that's kind of a dead giveaway if you know what I'm talking about. First of all, let's take a look at this statistical graph. And this chart shows in the gray, in the number that's going up, that's the United States rate. Let me see if I can actually point at it here with my mouse pointer. Good, you guys can see that. This is the U.S. rate. It's up to 13.3 deaths per per 1,000 people. Take a look at the red. This is Arkansas. And at one point in time, in 2008, 2009, Arkansas was ahead of the national average, 7.2 to about 5.5, 5.6. But Arkansas, in 2010, we were spot on with the national average, as we actually saw those begin to go down. Look at this. Since 2009, Except for a couple of years, well, the last three years, opioid prescription, opioid related overdose deaths fell in Arkansas from 7.2 to 5.6. Still a very concerning number, 5.6 per 100,000 people. But if you are talking about statistically speaking, something looks to have gotten better from 2009 to around 2013. Now, as nationwide, this problem began and continued to skyrocket here in 2013, 14, 15, 16, 16 being the most recent year we had numbers for today. Um, even though they continued to skyrocket, Arkansas bumped up a little. And then in 2016, we went ahead and dropped back down to 5.9. Uh, the lowest number we had seen was 5.6 in 2013. But that is a significant development because every major state affected by this, the top ones, those states are, number one, they're beating this national trend. They're way ahead of it. Arkansas is not. Arkansas is doing better. We're getting something right. So why is that? Why are we getting it right? I think it, and I could be completely off here, but I think Arkansas gives a lot more credence and credibility and listens and pays attention to our law enforcement officers than you probably see in a lot of other states, like um, New Hampshire maybe. Although I would assume West Virginia is a state that pays a lot of attention to law enforcement. This is a graph of how West Virginia's numbers are doing. In this case, this number down here is that number we saw for Arkansas, this number. Look how it looks for West Virginia, because West Virginia's numbers are more around the 45 deaths per 1,000. Arkansas, 5.9 per 1,000. Ten times our numbers. Now, West Virginia is the number one state for opioid-related deaths. It's a big mining state. Education there is shot. It's terrible. Uh, it's uh, a state that uh, they've had uh, the issues with the coal and, and things like that. So you may have a lot of folks that have health and respiratory problems and probably a lot of prescriptions as well. Uh, the, I thought that, interestingly enough, the number two was D.C., uh, not related maybe to our politicians, but perhaps to uh, just the folks that live there. But the natural state has less than half the number of deaths per 100,000 people as the national average. 5.93 deaths versus 13.3 as the national average. In other words, Arkansas is doing better. We're actually doing pretty good. We're getting it right, or at least right-er. That's not a word. But also the national numbers skyrocketed and Arkansas's bucked that trend by dropping from 7.2 deaths per 100,000 in 2015 to where we're at now. As we dropped, everybody else went up. So we're doing better than the other guys and we've established that. Once you establish that, now let's just focus on us and see how we can make ourselves even better. This is a statistical graph showing, what would this be called, a line chart? 
I don't know. Uh, it's, but it shows the number of opioid-related overdose deaths in Arkansas uh, for the, you know, well, since 1990s and right at the end. And it divides those up into the total, which is the yellow. Uh, for heroin, this is going to look a little bit difficult to see because this shows, a, th this line right here, this top line is not heroin. This, even though it looks a little bit like it, it's keyed out. That's supposed to be prescription opioids, RX opioids, okay? So this line represents this right here. Prescription opioids are contributing to the vast majority of the problem. Look at this. In 2016, 169 number of deaths, 132 prescription opioids. 38 were synthetic opioids. And then tiny amount, 13 were from actual heroin. It's pretty incredible to think that this 13 number is 10% is of the number that's coming from the pharmacist. Right? It's an incredible number. But Arkansas is far ahead of the national average for opioid prescriptions written. This one's not good for us. For every 100 people in Arkansas, there's 117 opioid prescriptions. I'm not making that number incorrect or, or screwing that up. Because the national rate's 79 per 100. There's 3.5 million prescriptions in Arkansas for opioids. There's just over 3 million people. We have far more opioid prescriptions than we do people. And when you consider that most of those people are not taking them, it's not a one-to-one -one or a two-to-one ratio. It makes it look like more like some people are probably getting 10 or 15. And the pill farms just keep pumping them out. Because there are a lot of doctors out there that are interested in the money. Some other statistics that came from the same numbers I pulled from the CDC that I found interesting and I did want to share with you today. In 2014, almost a million Americans had HIV. Of those, 18% were males, injection drug users or IDUs. That means they use needles to put their drugs in. 22%, point, 23 really, were females. So what we learned through studying these statistics was this. In 2015, new HIV cases in Arkansas, 258. 7.6% of those were from men using needles. 24% were from females. For some reason, there is a huge disparity here between females using needles and males using needles. In other words, you have a much better chance of catching a transmittable disease, just statistically speaking, by being female and, of course, using drugs. In the Arkansas lawsuit that's been filed, 72 counties and 210 cities are representing 90% of Arkansas that's, that have filed the state court lawsuit against the 65 drug makers and individual defendants. Uh, this was filed, you remember we've covered this um, for a minute and a half here on the NEA report. Uh, Attorney General Leslie Rutledge tried to get in on the action by filing a lawsuit afterwards and then asking the Arkansas uh, Supreme Court to dismiss the first one. That uh, didn't work. And uh, as we know now, Scott Ellington's lawsuit that he is involved with, with the uh, Arkansas counties and all the municipalities, is uh, proceeding forward. I'm pretty sure Attorney General Rutledge is also proceeding forward with hers as well. Um, nonetheless, that received nationwide attention because it, well, at least the Arkansas County lawsuit, but also Rutledge's follow-up, uh, because it showed that Arkansas, uh, which was probably one of several other states, were going to be pursuing legal uh, ramifications and remedies against the opioid manufacturers, seeking legal relief, in other words, for those in the state itself affected by this problem, which came about because a for-profit company lied to the public. And evidence exists that, it, that, that these companies knowingly lied to the public. And the opioid problem clearly uh, has created a major, major concern. Of course, now, if one of our businesses lied to the public and a bunch of people died, we would be history. But when, in America, whenever you have you know, 50 billion or whatever Johnson & Johnson and all these companies have, they'll just end up with a fine that probably does it even affect their profits? It's kind of sad when you think about it. However, Arkansas does have an opioid problem, and it is sad. It's just not nearly as bad as we had heard it was, which is good news. Not that anybody needs to start taking any pills. 
It's the bottom of the hour, and we ask you guys in chat, what did you think of Roseanne being canceled today? Uh, the news is, if you didn't know about it, Roseanne sent out a tweet where she referenced uh, Valerie Jarrett, a member of the Obama administration. She said she looked like a cross child between the Muslim Brotherhood and Planet of the Apes. That tweet was racist. It got her uh, a ton of heat online. One of her producers, comedian Wanda Sykes, actually backed out of the program and quit the program on Twitter, uh, ABC has uh, come out with a statement and they have canceled the show over one tweet. That that specific one. Of course, you could argue that there's more than that uh, behind it. <clears throat> now, we ask you in chat, what do you think of Roseanne being canceled? Uh, it's probably the only person that begins with the name R-O-S-E uh, that uh, Donald Trump likes. Uh, he's not a big fan of the other Rosie in Hollywood. And here's what Jay Smith said. He's ready to cancel ABC. That's what Jay's idea was. Uh, appreciate your comment, Jay. Jerry, I'm sorry, Sherry Ray. What, I was looking at somebody else, uh, something else, totally there. Sherry Ray said uh, that was tacky even for Roseanne. Appreciate you, Sherry. Thanks for joining and chat with us today. Cindy Johnson said, hey, it's canceled. I enjoy watching TV, but they keep canceling the shows alike. Makes me not want to watch anymore. I don't blame you. I don't blame you at all. Maybe if, uh, maybe you can watch us instead. I don't know. That's some cheesy joke. And Arthur Smith said, the moving company moved my parents twice. Thank you, Arthur, for that. Appreciate that. Appreciate the moving company. Out there doing great work for everybody across Northeast Arkansas. Appreciate them supporting us here on NEA Report, and we appreciate all of your support as well. If you haven't just yet, you are invited to go and subscribe to us on YouTube. You can find us there. Just search for NEA Report. We're also on Twitter, at NEA News. And if you didn't realize it already, yes, you're on Facebook watching us right now, where we broadcast live every day at about 3 p.m. I'm Stan Morris. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today on the program. We're Haley. back tomorrow with more news. Hello, Haley. Didn't mean to do that. More news from Northeast Arkansas. And uh, don't forget, if breaking news breaks out, we will, uh, as always, break in. As a matter of fact, I just received an email in uh, the uh, line of that. And I want to... Okay, so... There was a, an automobile accident involving a bike a short time ago, <clears throat> and uh, let me get it off of this. I don't want to have this uh, as the background while I'm reading the story. Uh, an automobile accident involving a bike happened a short time ago, and I've received uh, the information. I just want to go through here before I read any of this to you. There, the, This is live breaking news coverage here on NEA Report. Um, so a short time ago, an automobile accident happened. It involved a 15-year-old uh, on a bike, apparently. Um, do we have that tweet from E911 director Jeff Presley? Let's see if I can show that. Yeah, this was the tweet that Jeff Presley sent out a short time ago. Uh, I've now got a little more information about this. It was reported at 11.46 a.m. at Washington Avenue and Meadowbrook Road. Uh, the driver of the uh, first vehicle is a 2009 Ford truck. Uh, that's dr it was driven by Andrew Roberts. It said 32. Uh, it says that the bicycle was driven by a 15-year-old juvenile. It says the bicycle was northbound on Meadowbrook Road when the Ford truck was eastbound on Washington. It says the bicycle failed to yield the right of way to vehicle one and struck vehicle one behind the right passenger door. Looks like that's what happened in that accident that we reported a short time ago. Of course, anytime we hear of a bike car accident in Jonesboro, it, it immediately worries uh, a lot of us, especially some of us who've lost a friend in uh, similar accidents before. Um, this does not make a mention of injuries. It actually does not appear to have any kind of indicators involving that. Okay, so I'm guessing there's going to be another update on this. I do believe that there was a landing zone, it says on Washington Avenue, that was uh, established. In fact, you can see it in the tweet there. Um, so I don't know the condition of the team. Hoping he's okay. It doesn't make it sound like he... Uh, it says he struck behind the right passenger door. It makes it sound like his momentum carried him into the vehicle. Um, 
so nonetheless, I don't know the condition of that that uh, fifteen year old, but there was a fifteen year old injured on a, a bike involved in a, a accident with a Ford truck, and according to the report from Jonesboro Police Department, it was the uh, bicycle. <clears throat> it looks like that was in the uh, wrong, at least according to this, by failing to yield the right of way. I'm Stan Morris. Now you're up to date on NEA Report. We're back tomorrow with more news. Have a good evening.